today, though, um, I want to talk to you guys uh, just for a few minutes. I know we're smelling brisket and there's cake, and it's hard to pay attention for everybody, including myself. But um, we're going to continue a series that we started a few weeks ago um, called Bible 101. And in this particular series, um, the whole idea is that we're trying to walk through the big picture of Scripture. Uh, because it's important, if we're going to say we live by Scripture, to actually know what Scripture teaches, right? I mean, we can say all the time, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of buzzwords around Christianity. There's a lot of things we can say, but if we're going to truly live by the Word of God, then we've got to know what the God of Word actually says. And that's kind of what this sermon series is all about. It's kind of bringing us all to a common understanding of what the Scriptures actually are talking about so that when you're out and about or in your daily life and you read the Bible, you'll kind of have a better idea of how it fits together and what God might actually mean in that particular passage that you're reading. And in this time, we're also not just taking a bunch of knowledge and putting it together. We're trying to take some practical application out of the stories that we read that apply to our lives today. And um, a couple of weeks ago, we left off with a guy named Abraham, and we're going to kind of pick up his story again here in just a minute. But the main thing that we're going to talk about today, uh, from a topic standpoint, is probably something that I'm not just trying to oversell it. I think if, if we could get this one thing nailed down, it would revolutionize our entire lives. I really do. I don't think that's overselling today. I think the topic that we're talking about today, out of the passage that we're talking about today, I really do believe, I was thinking about it, uh, just, just getting ready for this sermon. Man, if, if I could get this one issue under control, I really do believe it would open up an entire world of possibilities um, in my life. And that's the issue of doubt. Uh, everyone in here probably knows what it's like to doubt, right? Everybody in here has doubted something at some point in your life. And and I'm not here to tell you that all doubts are bad, okay? When we talk about doubting, doubting can actually be a very healthy thing in your life. As a matter of fact, doubt is kind of is defined as this, and to kind of help you understand. It's a state of indecision. It's a feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. And in other words, when you doubt something or when you doubt someone, you're calling into question whether or not you can have confidence in that thing or in that person. Well, the reality of this life is we don't need to ignorantly be confident about everything. Amen? Some of you need to get less confident about your driving abilities, okay? You need to doubt your skill level a little more, right? Some of y'all, you know what I'm talking about, right? You jump out to pass someone. Plenty of room, right? Have you ever been in the middle of that period of time of passing someone and realize you should have rethought that decision. Y'all ever do that? Man, I rode with one of my best friends in the world, Mike Stewart, this week. Let me tell you, Mike flies 737s for a living, but he drives faster, okay? <laughs> we jumped out to pass someone. There was no doubt that we were going to get around him in time. I was just doubting if we were going to live as we broke through the sound barrier going past him. Like, like sometimes doubt's a good thing, right? If you're in a sketchy neighborhood, it's okay to doubt whether or not I should go around the corner to that dark alley. Doubt will preserve your life at times, okay? Doubt's not always a bad thing. Some of us, as husbands, we've confidently walked into a situation with our spouses thinking we've got them right where we want them, right? And, and you should have not been so ignorantly confident in that moment. You, you're with me, right? How many of y'all ever went into a conversation thinking, I got it? only to realize halfway through, I ain't got it. Y'all ever done that? Doubt is not always a bad thing. But in the Christian life, when we talk about doubt, specifically what we're talking about today, we're, when we're dealing with God's promises, when we're dealing with what God has already spoken, when, we, when we're dealing with what God is leading us to do, doubt can be an incredible obstacle to living out the life that God has called us to live. Well, when it comes to what God has already spoken, there is not really a lot of room to be doubting. We, need, we can doubt, but we need to move past doubt into conviction in order to fulfill the calling that God has on our lives. You live in doubt, it keeps you from taking the, quote, risk that God is calling you to take with your life. You see, the measure of doubt you live with directly correlates with the amount of risk you're willing to take for the kingdom of God. If you live a small life in the kingdom of God, there's a good chance you have a lot of doubt about what God can actually do in your life. 
the more conviction you get with God's ability and God's love for you and God's care for you and God's desire to work in you, the more, quote, risk-taking you can do because you have confidence that God will take you through whatever you face. It becomes a lot easier to obey the Word of God when you believe the Word of God. That's what we're talking about today. We're not talking about doubts that, that center around what God has spoken, what God is teaching, what God is leading us to do. Doubt can be very much a preservation thing in life, but when it comes to living out the Christian life, confidence in God is needed if you're going to walk out the life God has for us. And so maybe you're in here today and you'd say that you aren't really living the life God has called you to live. Maybe there's some areas where you've not submitted them to God. I would submit this to you. Most of us, in the areas that we say we're struggling in, it's not so much the area that's the issue, it's the doubt that God can come through for us if we do it His way. Whether it's in your finances, whether it's in your relationships, whether it's in uh, the way that you deal with your coworkers, no matter what it is, God has a way in which to conduct the affairs of this life. And when we go outside of that, it's almost always because we don't really know if God's way will work. Amen? It really is. If we, if we hold back our money and we're not generous with people around us, as God's called us to be generous, God's commanded us to actually be generous, if we hold that money back, what we're saying it's not, well, I've just got a character issue. We're saying, I don't think God can replace what I give, so I'm not going to give it. You see, it's a doubt issue at heart. In our relationships, in our romantic relationships, when God has a standard for purity and God has a standard for holiness, and we say, you know, I mean, everybody else is kind of doing these things. It's just kind of normal. It's unreasonable to expect this. What we're saying is that we don't believe that God's method and manner for marriage and relationships is really the best thing. We believe there's a better way. We're doubting God. If you look at sin at its very essence, it almost always comes back to doubting that God's way is truly best. And so doubt is a major issue in the Christian life. Well, last time we talked about a guy named Abraham in Genesis, we talked about the first sermon of the whole series was the creation, right? That God has created all things. And then we talked about the second sermon, how everything kind of went haywire, how sin entered into the picture, and mankind rebelled against God. And that because of that, he was separated relationally from a holy God. And then last week, see my squeaky voice, two weeks ago, we talked about Abraham because that's when we start seeing God begin to put the plan of redemption to buy back human race that rebelled against him to bring them back to himself in a relationship. And he's going to do it starting with a guy named Abraham in the Old Testament. Go back and check that message out if you haven't heard it. I don't have time to recap. I like to say it's a pretty decent message to get you caught up on this series. But the ironic thing is, is today we're going to talk about Abraham again. But where we talked about Abraham's great faith last time we preached, we're going to talk about Abraham's doubt this time. Because doubt nearly derailed Abraham. One chapter later, we were in Genesis 15, we're going to be in Genesis 16 today. If you've got your Bibles, turn there. If you don't, we'll put it on the screen. We're going to read Genesis 16, 1 through 16, and catch you up to this story. Many of y'all heard this story. If you haven't, listen up. It's a wild one. You ready? It says, now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. Now, remember, the promise was that God was going to make Abraham into a great nation. Problem was, Abraham was 75 years old. Sarah was 65 years old when God made that promise. Ten years have passed. Okay, ten years have now passed. Abraham is now, I'm sorry, Abraham's now, yeah, ten years later, he's 85, and Sarah's 75. Okay, that's where we are in the story. So ten years have passed since God told Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. You're going to have children, and they're going to have children, and they're going to be so incredibly vast that you can't even count them. There's going to be so many of them. And so, Abraham, you're going to be made into this great nation. We know that nation is the nation of Israel. But 10 years have passed when we get to chapter 16, and it says, Abram's wife had borne him no children. But she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. 
And so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked and with contempt on her mistress. And Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. And, but Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. And then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. And the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant. You shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. And he shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and again everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. And so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. For she said, truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. And therefore the well was called Ber Leharoi. It lies between Kadesh and Barad. <clears throat> and, Ab- and Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So he's 85 when she conceived. He's 86 when she delivers. That's the math, okay? So I'm going to keep this as G-rated as possible today. But it's hard, okay? But here's what's going on. Long and short of it, right? Abram has been promised by God that God is going to make him to a great nation. He's going to have children from his own flesh. And they're going to, they're going to be so, so vast you can't even count them. They're like sand on the seashore. But it's been 10 years has gone by, and they begin to get a little antsy. And so they hatch a plan <laughs> to utilize this servant named Hagar to stand in the place of Sarai, and it works. She is pregnant. She has a child. The problem is the plan works physically in their minds, but God was not pleased with this plan. Their doubt is what's going to lead to almost derailing what God wants to do in their lives. And so there's four points I want to give you today that we're going to pull out of this text about how to not be derailed by doubt. And I want to show you from this text some things we learn from Abraham and Sarai. It says in verse 1, Abram's wife had borne him no children. Ten years since the promise. Guys, I want you to know something right now. I don't know about you, but I think my childbearing years are behind me at 43. Right? I, I sincerely hope my childbearing years are behind me at 43. Now, now here's the thing. I've already got three kids, so I'm good to go, right? But if I'm 75 years old and I'm childless and my wife is 65 and and it's not happened by now, it's probably not going to happen, right? But then God comes on the scene and God gets their hopes up. There's no other way to say it. Hey, I'm going to do something in you. I'm going to perform a miracle in you, and you're going to have children one day. Now, I don't know what that's like, but I can only imagine if you're a 75-year-old man and you're a 65-year-old woman, and your heart is aching and longing and desiring to have children, that must have been an incredible news to hear from God that he's going to make it where you can actually have kids and you can celebrate a legacy that you get to leave one day. Like, it's a big deal to these people. But there's, there's 10 years' time that goes on. And I don't know about you, but if God promised me, me something, I have trouble waiting 10 minutes, much less 10 years. And here's the thing. If I'm already 75, I'm thinking, I know God can perform miracles, but I am 75. I'm now 85. I'm starting to wonder if I got it wrong with God, right? I'm starting to wonder. Like, like, there's been so much time has passed. There's been so many things that have happened. And I can only imagine that this waiting and this delay in their own mind of God working in their life began to eat away at their confidence that God was really going to come through. I'm going to tell you something. To deal with doubts, you have to identify 
your triggers or you will become subject to doubt quicker than you can realize. What I mean is this. Waiting and delaying what God says he's going to do is probably one of the greatest obstacles to being faithful to God today. How many times do we run ahead of where God is wanting to work because we think he wants it right now? I don't know about y'all. I don't struggle with what God wants to do in my life. I really don't. I struggle with when God wants to do it in my life. I, I rarely, I mean, rarely in life do you sit around and look at what God's doing in your life and be like, I don't like any of that. Most of the time, when I look at God's Word, and I hear what He's saying for me to do, and when I'm spending time in prayer, and I feel the Spirit is directing me and calling me and moving me to do something, it's almost never an issue of what that I struggle with. It's an issue of when. When can be the greatest obstacle to dealing with your doubts that you'll have in your Christian life. Many of us in this room are dealing with the consequences of running ahead of God years ago in some area. Some of us right now are dealing with fallout and frustrations and issues, relationship difficulties, financial struggles, whatever it might be, not because God was not going to take care of us, but because we did not want to wait on him to begin with. Let me tell you, one of the greatest triggers to your doubt will be the time it takes for God to come through. But here's the thing I want you to know. God is always on time. He's always on time. You may be in a period right now where you're kind of waiting. You're sitting there thinking that, man, God, I just, I'm waiting on the spouse that I want you to send me. God, I'm just waiting on this and I'm waiting on that. And as you wait, the longer it goes, the more that doubt can creep in. But, but not just waiting. Look at the other issue here. This is, a, this is a culture that deals with shame and the way things look. And it's very clear in this particular culture, this ancient culture, that the ability to have children was considered a blessing by God. So, so now Abraham and Sarah, they're not just dealing with waiting. They're also dealing with this idea, does God really favor us? If he favored me, I would have children by now. If God was for me, then, then it would be going a different way. God must be against me. And that's the culture of the day, right? Even, even Sarah, when she looks at this, she even says it when, in verse 2. She says, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. The idea is that if I bear children, God favors and blesses me. And if I'm not, then I must be out of favor with God. I want to tell you something, that had to cause incredible pain and shame in their lives. Pain and shame in our lives will cause us to let doubt creep in to our hearts about what God wants to do in our lives as well. You see, they, they were operating from a position, not just of waiting, but also of beginning to wonder, because of the way their culture was, are we really favored by God? Is God really even for us? And when you're waiting on God, one of the quickest things that Satan likes to do is to begin to get you to doubt how God really sees you. Because if you can begin to see that God is not really for you, you can justify going around God a lot quicker. You can justify going around him and doing something around the processes he has in your life. Because if he's not for you or he's not with you, then why are you staying where you are? You might as well do something. And that's one of Satan's greatest tactics is that God is really not with you. It's what we saw back in the Garden of Eden. If God really cared about you, Eve, if God really cared about you, Adam, he would want you to eat that fruit so that you can know things just like him. But God is holding out for you. Let me tell you, that's one of the greatest triggers that causes doubt is this belief that God is somehow holding out on us. There was a really sweet couple that I, in my church when I was growing up, and they didn't have children. It made me think of them, this passage of Scripture. And, and I'll never forget, they were the sweetest couple, used by God greatly, spiritual giants in my eyes. They really were. I just remember them from a small child all the way through my high school experience, just pillars in the church, pillars in the community. But what was secretly going on inside is one day my dad began to talk to the, the older folks, uh, this older lady in the, in, in the couple, and, and they began to talk about the fact that they never really could have kids. And here's how she, uh, uh, this is actually the, 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 the conclusion she came to. God must have thought that we wouldn't be good parents. So that's why we have no children. And it got me to thinking, if someone that seems 
that much of a giant spiritually can deal with doubts like that, then we all can deal with doubts like that when life's not going the way we feel like it should. And we begin to question, what does God really think of me? And we begin to live in shame, and we begin to live in fear, and we begin to live in embarrassment. Not, not only that, no doubt for 10 years, I mean, if God had come to me and told me that we were going to have kids, and he was going to make me into a great nation, I'm going to be honest with you, this is speculation, I think they probably told people about it. I really do. I, I can only imagine, this is a guess, but I can imagine that Abraham and Sarah, the word was probably out that God was going to do this incredible miracle in their lives. And now 10 years have passed, and can you imagine walking to the family reunion, and you still ain't got kids, and you begin to have an itch that you can't quite scratch, and you begin to try to go, we got something's not right. We got to fix this. We got to do something because it's getting embarrassing. It's getting, it's getting too much. Too many people are asking about it. I'm telling you, public opinion can cause you to begin to doubt God and try to go around him in your life. And so, so identify the triggers in your life that are causing you to want to circumvent God's plan for your life and name them out loud. It's important you do that because if Abraham and Sarah had pay, paid attention to this and said, you know what, it's the delay in God's fulfillment of the promise that's making us want to do this, we know that that is not how God operates. It's God's timing or no timing at all. They could have stepped back from this situation but when you get in the middle of the valley, it's hard to see what's in front of you. And so you've got to identify the trigger. No doubt that God had, quote, delayed this in their minds. But I'm going to tell you something. It didn't mean that God was not going to fulfill his promise. As a matter of fact, it's going to be another 15 years from this point before they ever have the child that God promised. So Abram was going to be 75 when God promised him something. He was going to be 100 before God fulfilled the promise. One-fourth of his life, he was going to wait on God to do it. I only tell you that because I think there's probably people in this room right now that you're in a period of waiting, and you're in a period of, 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 of just wondering what God is up to, and you're in a period of hopefulness, hoping that God is going to do that miracle or do that thing or, 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 or come through on his word for you, and you're just waiting right now, and you're, you're getting the itch to step outside of God's plans to take care of things yourself. And I'm going to tell you, that will be a tragic and fatal mistake if you do. Abram makes a huge mistake here, all because he was hurting it was taking too long. He was dealing with all the issues around him. And finally, he just had enough. And that's when he let doubt win. So he identified the trigger. Secondly, fight the urge to be clever. I, I want to make sure you hear me. Fight the urge to be clever if you're going to deal with doubt. So, so Hagar hatches a plan, right? And, and in this culture, I want you to know this plan today would probably not fly in most marriages, right? I'm just going to assume. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that this would be an obvious no, you know, in most marriages in 2024. I'm just guessing. If your marriage is like mine, it would be anyway. Um, it would be a no. Um, but from a cultural perspective, this was a practice that was practiced. Now, it wasn't godly. It wasn't God approved. It wasn't biblical. It wasn't what God desired. But the world was flaw is flawed, right? And so this practice was an ancient practice that, that people would, when they couldn't have children, or if they wanted more children, they would take a servant, and that servant would literally be the stand-in for them. And, and there's even some, uh, it, it's, it's crazy as I begin to do the study on this, there was even symbolic, physical ways that they did this to make sure that it was understood that this was my child, not yours. We're talking about at childbirth, the, the, the mother that was going to have possession of this child would sit literally physically with the person having, birth, having childbirth and deliver with her physically to make sure that there was no mistake this was going to be my child. I mean, it was, it was crazy what was going on in, the, in this culture, okay? So, so when, when Hagar is doing this, it doesn't sound as outlandish as it does to us, okay? So, so take that into consideration. However, it did seem like a very clever idea, right? God held out. It's not, you know, it's not happening. I think we should do this. And Abraham was like, yeah, why not, right? Typical guy. But anyway, he was like, sure. And what seemed like such a clever idea turns out to be a world-changing event. We'll talk about that in a minute. When we are facing unmet 
expectations with God's word or God's call or God's commands in our lives, it's so easy to start believing that we have a better idea than God does. It really is. It's so easy to begin to justify going a little bit around and outside in the, in the gray area of what God would have us do in order to accomplish what God already said he wanted to happen, right? So we're just kind of helping God, right? I'm just helping him. I mean, really, that, that's how we kind of think. I don't know about y'all, but I kind of think like that. Maybe I'm the only moron in the room, okay? But that's how I deal with it. Like, I'm going to be straightforward with you. I can literally take something, I'm like, I know this is the end that God wants. That's clear, right? I don't doubt that. So any means necessary to get there, God's got to approve. Not true. The means do not justify the ends when you're dealing with God's word. It just doesn't. The means do not justify the ends. It doesn't matter that it works out good in the end if it wasn't done in the process that God had called you to to begin with. It doesn't matter. And I can't tell you how many people that I hear and I see and conversations where there's a result of a really bad series of decisions and they want to celebrate it like, man, God is so good. Look at this. You're like, well, God is good and God can work in that. But God is not pleased with that. Right? I mean, he's still not pleased with it. I mean, that's the equivalent of like, you know, going to prison for 10 years for stealing something. You're saved there and you're like, praise God, you know. Clearly, I, 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 God, God's the one that called me to steal that because I ended up saved. Well, I mean, I get what you're saying, and God is able to work in prison, but, but really God is still not pleased with your theft. God, God is not pleased with it just because it ends up okay. Matter of fact, I would say that oftentimes when life is like that, we should just sit back and praise God that he does something good in spite of us. And, and most of the good that's come out of my life from really bad decisions, it's not because it was a good idea. It was because God is gracious and favorable and cares for me even though I'm a moron. I just know no other way to say it. it, it we, we, we fight this urge though, right? When things are not happening, when, 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 when you're, you're, you're single and, and times just keeps ticking by, right? Can I get a witness, Jeff? When you're single... I mean, God did not call me to that, Jeff. I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> it had to happen. But I can only imagine, right, that there becomes that moment where you're like, you just want a shortcut, and you don't want to do it God's way. But, but here's the crazy thing. Y'all need to listen to Jeff and Betsy's story one day. Jeff and Betsy right. Like, I've never met two people that match better than them. And it's because they didn't shortcut God. Yeah. They were senior citizens when they got married, absolutely. <laughs> but, but I have no doubt that Senor Jeff was worth the wait, right? I'll joke at this, I'm just picking that up. But right, I mean, but that, that's it, right? I'm just using that because that's a good example, right? It's so easy to want to, to want to go around God's purpose and compromise your values, compromise your stances, compromise your standards, right? It's so easy, guys, girls, those of you in high school going into college right now, it is going to be so tempting to compromise your standard of what you know you should be looking for in a mate. Matter of fact, um, one of our students here, years and years ago, I'll never forget, his sister was, was dateless, and she was really just getting frustrated trying to find a good guy, I'll never forget what he said. Sometimes you got to lower your expectations to increase your odds, you know. And he's right from a Hagar sort of way, but from a, from a God-honoring, God-waiting-upon way, do not compromise the standards that God has put out there for your mate. This world has got a divorce rate of about 50-50. And you know what I want to say? I don't know this, but, but I suspect this. I suspect that most of those could have been avoided had the picking been a little better. Let's just be honest. That's why, and this is, this is for my high schoolers and my college students. I want to tell you all this. Everybody else can check out if you want. 
one of the most important things you're going to do in your life is decide who you're going to date. Not who you're going to marry. You're going to marry whoever you date. The most important thing is who are you going to date? Because if you just date everything that has, you know, lungs and can breathe and can pay the check, there's a good chance you're going to marry something you shouldn't marry. I'm just going to be blunt. People think I've got to marry the right person. Date the right kind of people. And you'll be amazed at how much better your marriage can be. But if you compromise on the dating side, you run the risk of really making some poor decisions on the married side. Because by the time you get to the point where you're like, this is not the kind of person I should be with, you're already so emotionally invested in that person, you don't even know how to pull away. It's because you came up with a clever plan. You don't need a clever plan. You need God's plan, which is really the third thing I want to share with you real quick. Live inside the boundaries that God has established. This is huge. Look at verses 3 and 4 again. What happens is this transaction of Sarah saying, yeah, go into Hagar. And, and, and Hagar is not consulted, by the way, in this. Abraham saying, sure. And him going in and doing this thing. Abraham in this process is violating multiple things. He's violating his marriage covenant with Sarah. Because even as far back as Genesis 2, we see that a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This idea that polygamy was acceptable in the Old Testament, nowhere in Scripture do we see God approving of these things. We see examples of it, but we don't see that God approves of this. We see that mankind is broken and does what he wants, but nowhere do we see that God is pleased with this. Nowhere in all the Scriptures will you find this God to be pleased with multiple spouses. It's because God's design for marriage was a man would leave his father and mother and become one with one woman. One flesh. You can't become one flesh with 15 different people. One person, right? You get one. And he says, that's God's design. So Abraham is violating his marriage covenant doing this. He's violating Hagar for doing this. She's simply a servant who has no rights. And instead of him using his strength, for good, he uses it for violation. And then he, he violates really his relationship with God because he's doubting God's ability to come through. He goes along with a plan. If Abraham had just lived in the boundaries of what God had already taught and said in his word, Abraham never would have been in this boat to begin with. It, this is huge. Living inside the boundaries God has already established will keep you from letting doubt make you do crazy things in your life. We are all going to go through periods of doubt. We're going to all go through periods that are difficult. We're going to all go through periods of waiting that we are going to be tempted to go and do things we shouldn't. But if we will commit on the front end to do it God's way and God's way only, it will save us from a lifetime of poor decision making. Living inside the established boundaries that God has already laid out. I haven't told y'all in a while that I'm a pilot. And I need to make sure that I keep that before you because it's very important. Now, all joking aside, but, but one of the things I've learned flying little airplanes is this. Somebody told me this one time, and it's so true. They said, you know, the checklist on an airplane is there for a reason. If, if your pilot gets in, I want you to know, if you're ever flying southwest and somebody's smoking a cigar, and they walk out and kick the tires and hop in and start flying you, you should be concerned. There's a little list of things we should be checking before a plane goes up in the air. Why? Because it's there for a reason. And someone said this one time. They said, Chris, when you don't fly the checklist, you die. I can't tell you how many people we see you know, on the news all the time, all these aviation accidents, right? There's been a lot lately. And don't get me wrong, there's some that the plane just is faulty. But the vast majority of times, it's because a pilot's being a bonehead. Let's just be honest. Ran out of gas. I don't know about y'all, but there's one thing I like to have plenty of gas in. That's my airplane, right? Like I'm sitting there going, I'm not like, oh, we can make it. I never do that flying, ever, <laughs> ever. I want you to know if you ever fly with me, I know I'm kind of a clown in a lot of areas. I'm not a clown with flying. Why? Because you can die real quick, right? Like, I'm, I'm never like, that wing, it's a little loose. It's all, it's all good. Why? The stakes are too high. So you fly the checklist. You check everything. Why? Because when you operate inside the boundaries of how this thing is supposed to operate, the vast majority of time, you're going to have a great flight and things are going to work out a lot better. 
It's when you fly outside the boundaries of that checklist that you're putting yourself up for unnecessary risk. Same thing is true in God's Word. When we have the Word of God as our checklist for life, it doesn't mean that things still won't go wrong. It doesn't mean that things still won't go bad. But it does mean, as a general rule, when you fly your life according to the Word of God, you will find that you will have far less things to have to worry about later on. That you'll have far less baggage entering into your marriage. You'll have far less problems dealing, going into your mid, middle, mid ages. I mean, you'll have, you have far less problems going in to, to, as a senior adult because your whole life has been built on principles from God's Word that fuel a better life. It's just, it's just, it's just truth. But if you operate outside the boundaries God has established, like Abraham does here, you're setting yourself up for a dangerous situation. It doesn't mean that every time you fly without the checklist that your plane crashes, okay? That didn't happen. But you're putting yourself at an unnecessary risk over and over and over when you decide to do it your own way. So live inside the boundaries God has established. And then lastly, rest in God's grace when you blow it because you're going to. If you look at the rest of this passage all the way down through verse 16, you're going to see God interacting with Hagar. And I love the fact that God is tender to Hagar because Hagar was kind of a victim in this whole situation. I think Hagar is probably hostile towards Sarah because what woman would want to be in that position to begin with? Plus, Hagar was probably in her 20s to 30s. Abram's like 85 at this point. This is just a terrible situation for Hagar. Terrible. And so she resents Sarah for putting her in this position, right? It's just a bad situation. And so it comes across. She can't hide it, and she's, she's frustrated. And so Sarah then blames Abram. I love that part of the story. What have you done to me, Abram? Now, come on, Sarah, right? You asked for this, kind of like, I'm sorry to tell you. It was your idea. But regardless, it's, it's marriage, right? Who knows? There is no sanity sometimes. Anyway, it just happens. And then she pushes Hagar out, and, and Hagar is alone now, pregnant, alone, isolated from the life she knows. And God shows up, and he sees her. I love that part of the story. God sees her. And here's what's really cool about this story. Is I can imagine she's wondering, like, what's going to happen to my kid now? I mean, I was in this family, and Abram's going to take care of him. I don't even know who's going to take care of my child now. And God says, I'm going to take care of your child. He's going to grow up. You're going to have him. He's going to be the father of a lot of people, too. Now, that being said, his name's Ishmael, right? And just so you know, this is where Christianity and, and Islam split right here. Because Islam believes, people in, in Islam, Muslims pretty much believe that Ishmael is a great prophet. And Ishmael is actually the child of the promise, not Isaac. And, and look at the description. It says, You're gonna, he's going to be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand's going to be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. In other words, this guy and his descendants, there's going to be conflict just all the time. Does that look familiar in the world today in certain regions where Islam is predominant? Why is that? The next time you look at the news and you're like, what in the world's going on in this world? Understand, it started with Abram and Hagar and Sarah. It didn't start last week. It didn't start 100 years ago. This has been what was going to happen all along. There was going to be animosity in these descendants. And so the world, the world that we live in today is still filling the reverberations of this poor decision by Abram. So the next time you want to go outside of God's plan, come up with your own plan, go outside of God's lines, understand that you could be the father of another religion. No, not really, right? <laughs> but that's kind of what happened. Like, who would have thought that would happen? That's, just, that's insane. It just seemed like not a big deal. It was a huge deal. And it's lasted for a few thousand years now. Major problems because of this decision. But the beautiful thing is, is even with all the problems, when you go over to Genesis chapter 21, you see when Abram's finally 100 years old, that God comes through in his promise to give him a son. His name's Isaac. And what I love about this is that it shows you that even when you blow it big, there's a God who has grace to cover that mistake. We're going to have a, a song of invitation right now, and, and as we do, I'm going to kind of give you kind of an illustration that I think illustrates this to kind of wrap it up. You know, I think one of the greatest pictures that we can get 
of the relationship with God and his people is really a relationship between a parent and a child. Now, I'm not talking about a really hostile, corrupt, toxic environment. I'm talking about a relationship like it should look. I've got three kids. Y'all know that, right? Every one of those kids at one time or another has been rebellious, downright conniving, and pretty disrespectful. They, they've been like that, right? you got kids, right? I mean, I don't think mine are unique, okay? If you think yours aren't, you're, you're wrong because I know your kids, right? I mean, they're the same. They're not like that all the time, but they've been like that, right? They've had these moments where it's like, man, I don't know if I want to love them or kill them. I can't really decide right now. But flip a coin. We'll see what happens, right? But here's what's kind of true that I think is so important in this particular passage. Kind of, it kind of applies, or, or is a good correlation. It's no matter what they've done, I've never stopped caring for them, feeding them, nurturing them, and still trying my best to position them for a life of success. Even when they were not doing right by me, I continue to try to do right by them. Why? Because that's what a parent does, right? That, that's what we're called to do. And here's the thing, if I'm, a, if I'm an imperfect parent and I have that mindset with my kids, then can you imagine a perfect God who has perfect love, perfect mercy, perfect grace, when his children blow it, and we will, you must remember to run to the Father and not away. You see, that's what I think Satan's greatest ploy when we mess up is. Is God is done with you. You've messed up too much. You've blown it too many times. You've, it, this is just one too many, right? But, but, but I rest in passages in the New Testament that say, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The relationship that we share with God is not rooted in our obedience or our goodness. It's rooted in his love and his mercy and his grace. And so when you blow it, and you will, when you doubt and the doubts take you over and you begin to make decisions outside of the boundaries God has laid out and you have major consequences in your life because of it, you can still run home to the Father. And the reason I want to tell you that is because I believe there's probably people in this room right now that you've blown it, you've messed up, you've made decisions and that you're, you're dealing with the consequences right now. And you have falsely believed that God has washed his hands with you. As a father who is loving and gracious, you can be assured that is not how God operates. He has a relentless love for his people. My goodness, he leaves the 99 to go get the one. If that doesn't tell you the kind of love that drives the relationship that you have with God, I don't know what will. God truly loves you. So rest in his grace when you blow it. Because I've blown it. I don't know that I've Abraham blown it. Whole world religion. Billions of followers going to hell. I hate to say that. I mean, right? Like, it's, it's a big deal. Like, he blew it, guys. And God still fulfills his promise to him. Whatever you've done, don't buy the lie that God has done with you. Run to him, not away from him. I don't know about you, but this message has challenged me today because I think there's probably some doubters in here. I know myself, I'm one that I doubt, and it keeps me from living the life God has called me to live. I'll read some scripture, and I feel so motivated, and then I have to deal with people, and I just don't do it. Because I falsely believe they need my sarcasm more than they need God's word. I falsely believe I've got a better idea of how to handle things than God's word. And I'm reading a great book on worship right now. I actually just finished it this week. And, and one of the things I'm becoming painfully aware of is that most of this life, if we're going to truly be like Christ, we're going to find ourselves constantly humble, submitted, not getting even, not getting back, trusting in God, 
to make all things right. And that takes a lot of pressure off because you don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to figure it all out. God's Word is already giving you the mandate of how to live your life. The choice is yours whether or not you'll do it. So we're going to stand and we're going to have a song of invitation. And as we do, I'm going to let all our students, our junior high and high school, I'm dismissing you guys to the fellowship hall so y'all can get ready to serve. But we're going to have a quick song of invitation before we dismiss. And just do business with God. Is there an area of your life where you're doubting right now that maybe you're going outside the bounds of where God has established and you want to repent of that and go back where God has called you to live? Let's sing. Do business with God.